Hey, what's up? I'm Mike Squires, and this is Couchers Podcast, episode number 166. Let me dim the lights a little bit before I announce this guest. Let me dim the lights a little more. I know how he likes it. And my guest, Jeff Redding, the wonderful Jeffrey Redding, Mr. Reading, my second guest on Drummer Awareness Month. Drummer Awareness Month is a month at uh, Coutress where we focus on the most important part, the the most important part of a band. No, not, not anything other than a drummer, because if your drummer sucks, your band sucks. I've been in, uh, I've been in a band with Jeff Redding, two bands, sorta. Jeff Redding got me my gig with Rockaroki. You guys have probably heard me talk about Rockaroki uh, as a gig that I had in Seattle. Jeff Redding got me that gig. Jeff Redding is a fella. He's one of the most fun guys I've ever had the opportunity to tour with. Stellar drummer, stellar dude. He's fellas. Very, very stoked to have the chance to uh, talk with him on the podcast. He's got a podcast of his own called Seattle Today. They are recording there at the historic Moore Theater in Seattle. Um, and you should check it out. They got a bunch of killer guests. Um, and, you know, he's good at talking. And, a fu- and he's a funny guy. Like I said, he's fellas. I love Jeff. You love Jeff. Trust me. Now, uh, thank you for listening to the podcast very much. Uh, did I say what? Ba- Jeff was uh, Jeff was in Loaded, Duff McKagan's Loaded, which I am, I guess I'm still a member. We never broke up, but um, we're not really doing anything because I'm too busy. Everyone else is, you know, not doing anything really. Nothing important. Um, uh, he was also in uh, New American Shame, Green Apple Quick Step. There's another one I'm, I know I'm forgetting. He was in like every band in the early nineties. Um, and we played shows back then, but he's, he swears he doesn't remember me. I think that's bullshit. You remember me, Jeff. Don't be like that. Anyway, Jeff Steller. I'm very stoked to have him on the show. I hope you enjoy this conversation. If you are enjoying this conversation or you're enjoying the videos that we make, which Jeff's going to make an appearance on very soon. Right, Jeff? Um, you know, your support at Patreon would be very, very, very much appreciated. Um, you know, so far, not a nickel has gone into my pocket. It's gone right back into the production of the podcast and making these videos and having the audio mixed properly. And, um, you know... I have big plans that I'll transition this podcast and the video show into something much cooler and uh, more interactive and performance, live performance oriented uh, once this COVID shit passes. So your Patreon support will, it will be huge in making that happen. So I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Also, thank you to River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington. River City Guitars is a rad guitar store uh, specializing in vintage used and just cool stuff. Um, RiverCityGuitars.com or on social media at River City Guitars. Make sure to follow them on social. They'll post things there before they hit the website, and a lot of times they'll sell lickety split. You won't even find them on the website. They go quick. So make sure to follow them on social. If you have something that you are just sitting on, it's collecting dust, or you just don't love it like you used to could, consider selling it to River City Guitars. My guy Bobby will take very good care of you. I would not steer you wrong. You can give him a call at 509 509- Eight one eight seven six nine three. Tell him I sent you, or shoot him an email: sales.rivercityguitars at gmail. Maybe include a picture, not of me or of yourself, but of the 
the amp or a guitar or fancy old uh, echo plexi you're trying to sell i don't know what you're trying to sell but um bobby might be interested may in whole collections he's interested in anything from a single piece to whole museum collections he's buying every day is a buying day thank you river city guitars i love you thank you for watching thank you for listening i love you guys um don't forget the golden rule treat people the way you want to be treated it's not that hard just don't be a fucking asshole do you have the hearing the look on your face tells me no <laughs> oh you get the fancy mic is that it i am the fancy mic what you are the fancy mic aren't you you told me you were going to take a shower and stuff so i put on a button-up shirt and get <laughs> a shower. see if i can get you a little louder here try it again i don't hear that very often all right yeah i'm sure hey can you turn that guitar solo up a little bit yeah actually of all the guitar players you've played with I probably am not the one who was, I was not that all that much of a ball hog when it came to that stuff. I'm I like, uh, is that a question? You're myself, but I'm not like, is that a question or did you want to just talk to yourself this whole time? Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what this is about. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of a podcast. It's like a, you know, uh, I'm not sure I got my earplug, my earphones in, but uh, I'm used to hearing myself as well, and I can't hear myself. You can't hear yourself. Well, That's I can hear, yeah, but I can't hear it in me. I can hear you just fine, but I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to do that, but, you know, whatever. Drummers yeah. with technology. Yeah. Let's you don't that. handle this What's stuff that? with your podcast, right? What's that? You don't handle this stuff with your podcast, right? Oh no, we got it. We got a guy. We got we got uh, Mr. Dan Droz, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, he's what's our that guy. like? I mean, if I could have someone doing the stuff that I don't want to do for me, I would be so happy. I'd be pleased as a pig and shit. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, the the truth of the matter is, is that it's his gig. Like that's his corner of the triangle, and he still complains about it because it's awful. And we yeah, take his complaints, right. and we're like. We understand how awful it is. We really, 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 really appreciate you, Dan. Thanks for doing the 72 Not enough to pay you. Yeah. <laughs> well, he'll be the first to get paid. I can, I can assure you that. That's the, that's the way to do it for sure. D uh, Don Gunn gets uh, the, the lion's share of my Patreon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sweetwater gets the rest of it. What, because Cole, you've owed Cole money forever or something? What? No, not that band. Not the band Sweetwater. <laughs> are, are there any Sweetwater posters back there behind you? I'm, I'm looking around. Not one. <laughs> I don't really, I don't really appreciate the look on your face. <laughs> uh, no, there's not. I can tell you. Yeah. No, actually, I've, I don't think I've ever shared a, i think that we shared a bill with the park boys at one point perhaps right. in the uh tacoma i think the off-ramp or sub-zero or whatever at graceland right or maybe i just went and saw them sub graceland yeah how you doing buddy you're looking good thanks bud i'm uh, pretty good pretty yeah. good i finally sold my heat pump ac it was a big deal. It's a fancy, fancy unit that was just sitting there collecting dust. And I, someone finally is going to have a very cool summer in Leavenworth, Washington. Yeah. What yeah. is it? What does it do? It's an AC and a it's an air conditioning unit and a heat pump. And you know, it's just uh we had it for the weed farm and now that uh we don't need it any longer. Right. Yeah. I imagine a thing like that is isn't super cheap either. No, no, and it, yeah, but you know, uh, luckily we found the right guy, and the right guy found us, and uh, went out to the island this morning and made that a made that a reality. Transaction, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love a transaction when I'm on the receiving 
like take this and give me that roger I receive like the money yeah for sure give me the money yeah now what's on the shelf there behind you on the on the wood cabinet there oh though uh that's you know you're the first person to ask about that that used to be storage for a bunch of random horse shit up there you know uh -huh, let me okay. see if i can point up the yeah, yeah yeah you see all right and then uh i had that pedal board custom made of course do you see how it hangs over the edge oh it's a pedal board it's a pedal board it's more of a pedal display because nobody in their right mind would take a pedal board that size other than vernon reed to a gig uh you know fact check vernon reed doesn't use a pedal board he just spreads them out oh, all over no, the floor that's right i know because uh as, as you experienced yeah with your two square feet of stage room at the show box when you open for it that's it's true but i i think that he uses pedal boards now I've, i follow him on instagram oh well then hello vernon um he's uh God, that guy's incredible. Anyway, I had that thing made because I had this great idea that I would, I was like, what a wasted space. I'm trying to, you know, make it look better. And then boom, I have that custom made. You know what they say, right? Measure twice, cut once. Right. You yeah. know who says that? Edward P. Hewlett from EPH Construction. Uh, yeah, Hewlett's the dogs out. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, Michael Jermaine I, Squires. I fucking measured once and emailed once. That's cut. what I did. And so and then, it and then hangs cut. over the edge. And then cut three times. That's right. <laughs> so it hangs over the edge. It's too big. But he made me a, a really great pedal display. So wait, There's you a made a pedal. Fuckers up there. So wait, you made a pedal board that so it would fit on top of your cabinet? It's it's more of a display. Okay, so it wasn't meant right. to. Yeah. Okay. So that I there they are. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a way that it's they're all in view. But also if I'm here recording, I don't have to before they were like in a bunch they were just all over the place. We don't have a lot of storage in our house. Without all the mucky muck. That's right. You know, I know I could count on you to cut <laughs> to the chase with the verbiage. Yeah. A wireless, a wireless, exactly. I was looking to avoid the the mucky muck. Right. Yeah. Just go so, to Nigel. Oh, there it is, Black Thirty Five guitars. Made, I made that for me. They're cool. They, he used to make drums. I don't know what his drum company was called, but Brown Thirty Five. Yeah, probably, if there were drums. You know, you're uh, speaking of Brown. You are number two. Uh guest for drummer awareness month oh number two i get it yeah how does that make you feel um uh, well i suppose it depends on who number one was uh greg gilmore mr greg gilmore mr greg gilmore yeah oh, well then i feel like i'm in pretty uh pretty pretty solid company seattle's percussionist well yeah I mean, Barrett might have a thing to say about that, as would that Jared Kaplan fella. Look, you know. It's your podcast. Yeah, that's right. I'll make the rules around here. <laughs> I was so nervous when I met him. I met him, you know, 1995. And he was coming in to do a gig at a coffee shop. We talk about this already. But he just okay. had like, he had like yeah. a fucking doom back and a bunch of bells and shit, you know? And I was like... I was really impressed. I was like, wow, this guy is so cool. What that coffee shop was it? It was uh, the Lighthouse in Fremont. Oh, Fremont, yeah. Washington. Yeah. That's right. Fremont. Oh, that's right. Because you used to work there. That's right. I've worked. I think you, everywhere. you know, I think you probably worked there while me and Wally Lidke and Steve Caldwell and Greg Collinsworth, LGC. Mm. lived right over there across the street from ty willman and steve willman's like we were like i think we were what what years did you work there probably 90 95 to 97 dude we were there that like 
Yeah, we were like moments away from each other. Yeah. What's that? Did you ever come in? Yeah. Yeah. I had people skills back then, but I was terrible at customer service. Yeah, you know, honestly, I think back, I'm if I have to if I had to like if someone had a gun to my head, I'd say, "Yeah, I remember him. I think he was looking down at me and not literally." I don't I don't think so. I think it was like a coffee thing. Like I might've asked a coffee question and you weren't working. You were just sort of at the counter jawing with someone who was gonna be making the coffee. And my question didn't go over very well with you coffee snobs. If I had to say, I, but I- So but what you're saying is you're making up a story. Tell me how accurate it is. I don't think so. <laughs> because no, at maybe, that point we already played shows together you and i no we had sure we had in what band well i was in the eat the feeling and i was in i was every the, other was, every other band every <laughs> other band what was the band that you had with um stephanie and, and scott moonshine moonshine we played a half a dozen shows with moonshine but i never met you did I say no. we met? I said we played shows together. Yeah. You were probably like, this guy's gonna wear shorts on stage. No way. I'm not talking to him. I was like, my in Laughing Man, my guitar player, who I love dearly, wanted to sit down on stage. Oh no. And I was just like, dude, come on. I want to stand up. What? Why don't you play drums? And I'll wank around on the guitar, the second guitar. Why did he want to sit down? I think it was a Jeff Healy sort of thing. He wanted to play it on his lap? And... No, but he, he liked the idea of not being encumbered <laughs> by the weight of the guitar while he was trying to uh, inflict his virtuosity. Was he shy? Yeah, he wasn't a big, yeah, he wasn't, I mean, I wouldn't call it shy. He just didn't care about people. Right. So he wasn't like, make myself big on stage. So he was no guitar hero. He wasn't like, look at me, look at me. No, no. He, that was that was way beneath him. Even when he was insecure, he knew he was better than everybody else because he was a phenomenal guitar player. Right. Joe Fry, ladies and gentlemen. How many? I mean, we're going to be all over the place. Sure. And I'm not going to edit it because I don't have, I don't have someone fancy. <laughs> you rent Dan. I'll rent you Dan. God, I I would be willing to cough up the rest of my uh, Patreon yeah. to have someone else do that. Your your nine bucks. Sure. Yeah. Huh? Your nine bucks. Yeah, my nine bucks exactly. How many <laughs> phenomenal musicians do we know collectively that either, fuck, never got a fair shake. Or just got just a toehold, and that was, and then the the edge of the cliff broke off. I mean, for in some regards, we we have both of those things going on ourselves. But in terms of the you know the the big big time, but we got to do a bunch of really cool stuff in our lives yeah. musically. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, I think the biggest problem in in uh, in that in figuring out that equation is is that we l are from a city with an inordinate amount of lottery winners, of Rock Mountain lottery winners. So, the degree of success is so far off the charts. To, you know, if you got to base camp on Rock Mountain, <laughs> in any other city, you'd be a local hero. In ours, it's like, oh, dude, I'm so sorry, man. That's such a bummer it went down like that for you, you know? Well, I think, I feel like you and I both like almost summited, but we like lost a leg to frostbite, mm -mm, mm -mm. you know? <laughs> no, no, I, I like to look at it as we both, this is how I, I, I describe my own is like, I've been to base camp. Base camp is getting signed to a major label. Right. Right, so I've been to base camp four times and I've been in the death zone maybe not that many times. 
right? Because just because you get to base camp doesn't mean you're ever really in danger of breaking through. Right. Does that make sense? I don't know. Um, sure. but, but the bands that I, I like to think that, and some of the bands weren't as successful as they should have been for whatever reason. Right. Usually personnel reasons. <laughs> um, and, right. and so those are like, uh, those are the ones that like, oh, got into the death zone just with, but we couldn't handle it or something happened or, you know, it was almost never, it was almost never the industry that, you know, once it was the green apple thing, the industry sort of fell apart at the end of the, you know, uh, Pearl Jam did their downsizing. Kelly Curtis did his downsizing and green apple was sort of a, uh, uh, part of that <laughs> downsize, but you know, that band had made a few poor decisions up to that point anyway. So, but yeah, uh, I think we know a lot. If you, if you just, if you cut off the tops and the bottoms, you know, if you cut off the four or God, how many, I mean, even as far as like into the, the nineties and the aughts, you got your death cabs you got your uh you got your uh, modest mouse i mean those those bands are those Still. are lottery winners so that's six seven eight eight lottery winners in in you know 20 years is pretty phenomenal but if you cut those people off you and i look like big deals <laughs> 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 yeah baby <laughs> Here's the thing is uh dude as I sit and think about it, the difference between those two bands is Modest Mouse has put a, has put out three records since 2001. Maybe I'm making that up, but not very many. Mm -hmm. And Death Cab has put out like eight. I'm probably exaggerating on both of those, but there's not a... I started to think, well, these bands, they also worked really hard. They toured relentlessly. They They put records out you know, they were on a regular release and touring cycle. Uh, but then it's not, that's not really true. Like Modest Mouse just, like they won that fucking Grammy or whatever. And then they were like, all right, now let's get weird. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Yeah. yeah. It's like, the, it's like they, they put out 2112. It's like, okay, we can do whatever we want. Pretty much. Yeah. Which is a great position to be in. And, and who well, was I talking to? Like, when they put out a record, no one's like, who? Like, people are still jazzed about that shit. Right. And Dan, our, you know, so Dan Droz, our, our, our amazing engineer and, and cohort. Why don't you rub He it was in. asking, what's that? Rub, rub it, it in. in. Yeah, yeah, you were. Um, he was asking what, what success means. You know, what, what does it take to be successful? Right. And we talked about it for a while and we came up with, it really is only one thing. You have to have hits. You're only successful. If you're a one hit wonder, you're not a success because you can't go tour because eventually the publishing runs out and you have to be able to go support yourself on the road. And you mean might... commercial success? Sure, I guess so. But even, well, what, what's the, what other success is there artistic? Yeah, I would what, say so. But what's the difference between commercial and artistic? Well, I mean, we're I all that, art. Aren't we all artistically com uh, successful? <laughs> uh, no. I mean, some people struggle to remain productive because something doesn't even simply pay for itself. And I think that there is an amount of success that can be measured by that. Well, isn't, but that, isn't that, well, commercial, commerce, you mean financially, financially successful. Right. Right. So, and so, I don't, I don't know. I just don't think. I guess that's, com uh, that is a, a sliver of commercial success. There's just, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, artistically successful, if you're still passionate about doing what you're doing, regardless of who hears it. Does it really need to pay for itself? 
if a record drops on the internet and no one hears it does it really exist <laughs> you, you look at like deja right. deja has consistently put out records she's artistically successful you know right. i mean just because you know and i don't know like i don't know i don't know like we, i was talking about... that i i just always thought would get a bigger shot who you know, uh, I thought that I have always thought that she would get a shot. Well, the thing is, it's not too like she's still doing it. So yeah. she's still, you know, and she's, she's still relevant record, and viable. Like, very soon she's making a record. Did and did you see she just uh put up the pinups record on uh Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I'm stoked about that too. I there's, there's four really, really amazing tracks on that record. <laughs> let me guess they're the ones you played on is that right they're, they are they're brilliant they're really you, you know what i love about you is that you rarely uh rarely show any signs uh, of lack of confidence and i appreciate that about you uh yeah. in musical situations social situations all situations <laughs> well we're here aren't we yeah we are <laughs> may as well be here <laughs> yeah yeah well you know i don't know drumming is is uh what are you gonna do with a a drummer that's not confident right no that's a real question because you know what the answer is nothing Re replace him <laughs> yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah right because you know what they say drummer sucks band sucks yeah no, there's no way around that. And yeah. I really think it's the most important part of a band other than songs. Well, and if you're a jam band, you don't even really need songs. Right. Or if you're a trance band, you know, you don't even really need songs, but you still have to have a good drummer. Right. Because the hippies have to dance to something. Right. And you don't want to harsh their mellow with bad, yeah. bad, bad drum vibes bad beats yeah right. uh you used to wear puka shells right i mean you used to be a little bit of a hippie maybe hemp fest uh i got a pair of puka shells when my who was it somebody went to hawaii when i was in middle school yeah and i got a pair and i wore them until i i was like you know how you like you know the like the, the candy necklace you put up here and, you, <laughs> and I, I was like doing that you know just because you do that with a necklace that will barely reach and I, went, and I was very sad but i threw them all away it uh, never even it never even occurred to me to remake it with the shells so but i used to i used to wear some beads you know because you there would be you'd go to a bead place during folk life or something and make a stupid bead necklace for yourself you and your you and your friend would have a matching one or you and your girlfriend no i never did matching ones but I got, um, where is that? Well, you have a picture? I do, because we just put it up on our own uh, little. <laughs> and what's great is this, like, this little movie theater you've got here. It works uh, entirely as a, uh, as a picture-taking apparatus as well. And you had, um, you were a long hair back then. Yeah. Uh, well, I yeah for for a minute there. Yeah. Uh, tell me about Silly Rabbit <laughs> and how that how did that happen? How did your position? Well, explain your position in Silly Rabbit and how how you came to be in that position. But also, why didn't that band get a shot? Getting any of that? Uh, a little bit of it. I think that's the pinups there. No, that's Silly Rabbit. Oh, it is. That's not. That's not Deja on the mic, baby. That's me. <laughs> little sundress. I couldn't even make that out. I just thought that that was Dan on guitar because it was. He looks kind of sharp dressed. Yeah. Oh, here. How about this? Let's see if we can get that better. This. This is terrible radio. You know. Is it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that looks better. Oh. <laughs> are you wearing a skirt that's a sundress brother come on oh i'm yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry that's, that's uh johnny burke on guitar from the supersonic soul pimps 
Oh yeah, okay. That's Mr. George Aragon on the drums. Oh, crusher. And that's at the uh, the arena during Perfect. bumper shoot. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Um, that I band never get a shot. Oh well. Okay. Well, Tony's probably going to watch this, so I can't be entirely forthright. But uh, again, you know, bad management. I think you know, like uh, we. I went to high school with Tony, the rapper, the uh -huh. rap guy. And uh, he, he right out of high school, he and this other buddy of ours, Danny Howell, uh, got signed to Atlantic as a rap duo called Culture Shock. White rapper guys, 1988. Wow. Culture Shock. And then, and then somehow Tony thought it would be a good idea to enlist in the Marines and then Desert Storm happened and he got activated. He sounds like a genius. It's like someone I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so then, yeah, so he came back and then uh, I ran into him. I was kind of looking for him after um, I played in Sledge in the 88, 89. Sledge is a great name for a band. <laughs> uh to 1990 and then and then i started playing with steve caldwell from whatever uh and i finally found tony and i'm like dude we got to start a band and we started cavefish <laughs> that's a in contrast that's a terrible name right yeah it was horrible um <laughs> but and it was and then uh and at the time i was the house drummer for the open mic at the new world on tuesdays nice of course i was why wouldn't i be right. <laughs> how um, many drink tickets did you get for that gig what's that how many drink tickets did you get for that gig three that's pretty good that's better than average yeah and periodically i even get a couple of ducats maybe 20 bucks they feed you maybe what's that they feed you uh i don't think so even right. though it was a Chinese restaurant, but yeah, right. no. Um, but that's where I met Johnny and uh, and um, Tommy Nadow. Was that place uh, up on Eighty Fifth? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Met Tommy and Johnny, and uh, and John's brother Wayne, Dwayne, Wayne. They were kind of a three piece, and I. Met Johnny, and then he introduced us to Lawrence Martin from the First Thought. Yeah, okay. Um, and then they came over, and they were helping us out with this demo and realized that Tony could sing. And Tommy Netto told me this not too long ago. We were hanging out over at, uh, you know, Zach, Zach Malang? I don't know. Zach from the Supersonic Soul Pimps. He, oh, know. I know who he is. I don't know him. Yeah. yeah he's he's got a whatever we we're we we're jamming and tommy was there he's like like rehashing all this it's like yeah man they were like oh, well, we got to steal this rapper and tommy said well dude he's got a band he's what about these other you know so i didn't know that for a long time but whatever uh so they like stole him away and started this silly rabbit band that i was sort of a part of but tommy was the drummer originally and i would just sort of play percussion um and then i percussionist back then what's that everyone had a percussionist back then i believe it'd be more accurately everybody was a percussionist back then <laughs> you know, and it was like oh bongo ba -doo, ba -doo, ba -doo, ba -doo. you have any weird things that you did like uh, fisher price things where you'd like boing, 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 you know like uh crowd I scaled, I, I scaled it down to one set of bongos on a stand and it was really just an excuse so I could have a mic and sing and like flavor flavor my way around. <laughs> so there'd be like two songs that I... you weren't tied to the bongos by any means. You were around the stage. There was no leash. There was no, you know, there was no not like a saxophone or something, you know. <laughs> Although now that I think about it, that could have been pretty cool too. Um, no. And so there'd be like, but this was later. Like that band went on for a long time and had a lot of. A lot of different drummers. By the time George, I think, was the second drummer, and by the time he got in, I was really comfortable. Just like, no, okay, this this is my I carved carved out a little niche for myself. Right. Um, 
And um, yeah, and you know, I don't know, like, but it was sort of always Tony's thing and he sort of ran it like it was a little bit of the military. Um, well, it worked, didn't it? What's that? It worked, right? We got work done, but as far as um, camaraderie or um, or like a, a sense of, you know, um, like we're doing this together or if if one of us wins, we all win. There wasn't, didn't feel like that. It was just like, well, we're doing well. Got a lot of, you know, I think we were the most popular band at the Phoenix Underground that wasn't a national, right. you know, and that, that was, that was great. Just get to go do that every, every weekend or other weekend or whatever. That was super fun. Um, uh, but at some point I was like, what am I doing personally? You know, like are almost, you know, I'm not really playing drums. I mean, I still play drums in moonshine, but I wasn't, you know, really focusing. What a completely different experience you were having between moonshine and and silly rabbit those were those two things were happening at the same time and laughing man i don't know laughing man that was more of like a like a jam band it was like a dave matthews uh, the singer had really interesting stories and was like a really animated singer um great front man yeah. joe van hollebeck yeah um, and that was, that was guys I went to high school with. I went to high school with Joe and Steve Caldwell. And, um, and then Joe Fry was the, the guy who wanted to sit down. He was in that band. Um, lead guitar. I wanted to sit down. Yeah, he wanted to. Um, but uh, yeah, those three bands all at the same time. And then I would, you know, fill in with everyone else also. I played with Leather Rose because they needed a drummer to do a Tuesday showcase at the off-ramp. Is the leather rose, is that a nickname for a butthole? What is that? I'm sure I don't know, Mark. <laughs> I think it was, I think, well, I think Dusty Rose guys, and then I think it was like a, it was a take on the names of the, the typical sort of LA-ish sort of, I don't know, later on when I got into that, that band with Kelly and, and, and Paulson, they knew the Leather Rose guys. Like the Leather Rose guys had been part of the like Tramp Alley right. scene. Black is so they yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. All the, the South End guys. Exactly. Yeah. They kind of kept it a little sleazier down there, right? Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It was interesting to find out how. Like I'd never really heard of Tramp Alley before I started playing with those dudes. And then come to find out like all the guys up here, like all the, well, the Alice in Chains guys, the Mother Love Bone guys, they all played right. Joe's, you know. Uh, little known fact, Jimmy Paulson was, there was actually talk for a minute of him becoming the second guitar player in Alice in Chains. Really? And now Jimmy would say, no, no, it's not. It wasn't going to happen. But it's like, there was like, you know how like that th those fluid right. things happen and hey, maybe we need a, you know, I don't even know if they ever jammed together, but for a second there was like a, hey, maybe we should have yeah. I know another person who I think was talked about possibly being the guitar, second guitarist. Yeah. Who? Friend of ours. Mm -hmm. Jeff Angel. Oh, I can see that back then or more I recently. Can't or... See that he's not a member of a band. <laughs> I don't. Jeff Angel's well, not me, a member of a band. He's a band leader. But he's been around forever, though. And before he was Jeff Angel, he was Junior because he was so young. Right. And and was it back then? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was well, back know. when they were entertaining the idea of having a second guitar player. Right. Turns out they did fine with just the one. Pretty good. Pretty. They did pretty good. Couple of couple of nice size hits in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. Couple good ones. Yeah. They've got a repertoire they can take out now and then. 
way. Yeah. Uh, what? So you you lived you grew up in Edmonds, right? Edmonds, Washington. Edmonds, Washington. Which, for people who are not from Seattle, Edmonds is about back then. It was probably twenty minutes north of Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's like what forty five minutes or an hour and a half, maybe. Well, yeah. right now it's actually ten minutes because no one's on the freeways. But yeah. Right. It was it was a it was some horrible traffic for a long time. Yeah. It's just over the. The county line's at 205th there. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just on the other side of that. It was actually unincorporated Snohomish County. Didn't actually live in Edmonds. Edmonds was sort of a posh place. And I went to high school with a lot of those people, but we lived in a little further out of town. Right. Out of town. Well, it's a, it's very wooded up there. Like there's Edmonds down on the water and then that there's a, sort of that area between Linwood and Edmonds. And where is downtown Linwood? I don't even fucking know. But anyway, you. <laughs> I could tell you if you want to know. Yeah. Oh, tell me. Yeah, do. Fred Meyer. Okay. <laughs> Fred Meyer on 196 and 205th. That's probably downtown Linwood. I know that spot. Yeah. I know yeah. it well. Yeah. So, in you, how much was what was going on in the 80s in Seattle in that music scene? Was how much of that was in your like viewer, you know, like how, how much of it were you aware of? Were you interested in lo like local music, or were you like, I like fucking Motley Crue, and because that's what I mean, I was into that, but when I you know, when I found Mother Love Bone, I think it changed a lot of things for me. Right. Um, I was I was tragically unaware of what was going on until until I literally until I played in my first band. Like I knew. It's funny that um, the Edmonds Theater, a buddy, buddy of mine, worked there, and they would have shows there periodically. But before I, it was on my radar, and the Cowboys had played there. And they'd spray painted their name behind the screen. So that was the first time I was like, well, bands play here? You have bands? Um, uh, the Boibs was a cover band that did a lot of, like my freshman year, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, it was all cover bands. And then after that, it was all DJs. But ninth grade, um, the Boibs were the best cover band in the, you know, that we knew of, and they played a lot of the high school dances. Dave Cruzen was the drummer. Oh. That, they turned into the, um, what's the, the guys who did the Beatles thing? The, the, uh, oh. yeah. They still do the Beatles thing. Right. The, uh, oh, Nancy's going to kill me. There was this girl that I went to high school with named Nancy, Nancy Williams, and she knew, she knew Duff back in the day when he was nicotine, like, I don't know how she, where she, where she went, but she went where they were. Right. Um, but I didn't know about them until, I didn't know about anybody until, you know, after I was out of high school. Um, I met, so Chad Channing, who played on Bleach, mm -hmm. he was a, he was in my class at Woodway. Um, yeah, he, uh, and, and my buddy Mark at one point introduced us and I was a senior, it was senior year and I was the drummer in the jazz band and, and, uh, and he introduced me to this little guy with this leather jacket who just like, looked like, you know, like Chad Channing, this is unmistakable. And he's like, my friend's in a band. I'm like, right on, man. What, what's it called? Nirvana. I'm like, <laughs> great name. Okay. Like bliss. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do you play shows? He's like, yeah. I'm like, I don't know what else to say. You know, I don't know what. I didn't, I couldn't even relate to being in a band. I had no idea you were allowed to just go be in a band. Right. You know, it wasn't on my radar. It wasn't. Had, um, the career counselor at Woodway wasn't saying, you know what you need to do, kid? Uh, forget. Buy a, leather, <laughs> buy a leather jacket. Buy a leather jacket. Yeah, grow your hair. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, it, it, it wasn't. And so, you know, but years later, I'm like, motherfucker, that's too much. What about Queensryche? Were they on your radar 
No, well, so oh. that that wasn't until no. Well, you know, I don't know if you remember the show. Well, almost live. You remember that show? Oh sure. There was a show that was before that. There was like a, a local video show in the late eighties that I can never remember the name, but like uh Queensryche was on there. Um it must have been um what's the what's the really uh Metal Church? Metal, metal Church. Yeah, baby. Sanctuary. Um, Sanctuary, exactly. All the metal bands were on there, right? Mace, Saber. Yeah. yeah, I don't know about Mace and Saber. I'd rem- I, I, but I might not remember those. I just did. But so that was there. And I, so I, I recognized them as, as, as uh, local. But, you know. Fourth I didn't, Century. Uh, okay, so Fourth Century is from Linwood. Right. And so I knew about, they were like one of the first local bands that I was like, aware of that we're actually doing doing it you know and they um, got a deal right they got a deal with like mega force or some shit i don't know i don't know but i remember the first time i ever the first time i ever i remember seeing nirvana uh like being aware that it was a band was at shoreline community college and i was sitting behind a guy my freshman year who had the the rainbow uh, uh, purgatory and in the back it said crack smoking Satan worshiping butt fucking motherfuckers or something like that. Right. I'm like, okay, I guess I should get them on my radar. That's pretty cool. Right. Um, and then and the posies were probably actually they were that was during high school because they played my senior year, they played like the District 15 beach dance at the end of the year. Right. And uh, I talked to Musburger. I remember that distinctly, like having a conversation with him about like, you guys are just in band? You're just in this band. Where the fuck? How old are you? You know, and they're just like a couple years older than me. I'm like, motherfucker. It's you know? funny, you know, the, your your invite link to this video chat came 10 minutes before because I have been down a Posey's like rabbit hole today listen to frosting all day at work i think i'm gonna do a i think i'm gonna do one of their songs for for couch riffs you should get mike to play on it <laughs> well that's i mean that's doesn't, a little too close it doesn't little, really work out that way but it occurred to me like um they've gone through drummers have you ever did you ever audition for that band did we just talk about this no oh, that's hilarious i was just telling this story yesterday Oh. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've got this article from uh, a moonshine article that was in what was the what, what was the what, what was the uh, the University of Washington paper? Gla- the glass onion. Student. The glass onion. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, it said uh, Joe Bass played on. We met Joe. I don't even know where we met him from. But we met him and he played on a, a moonshine tune and came in and mixed to help us mix some songs. And the article says that he's going to help us get a record deal because he really likes us. Um, and so I knew Joe like in 93 or 94. Whatever, dude. <laughs> Whatever, dude. Yeah, totally. Um, and when, when, uh, what was the original bass player's name? That was uh, Chris. Huh? Chris. God damn it, Matt. Uh, uh, Matt. Could have been Matt. Uh, God well, damn it. Anyway, well, nice. Oh, it'll come to me. I've played yeah. with him. I'm super embarrassed. I'm I'm ashamed right now. You should be. Um. So when he uh, so Joe replaced him, and then Musburger left. And Joe got me a tryout. It was probably 1994 or 95. Really? Yeah. At the and, did you go to the practice space there on Capitol Hill over by the uh, Puss Puss? Um, I would have if I tried out. Right. Yeah, but I didn't. Oh. Like I was like so. Anytime, yeah, I didn't. Like I got all kind of like a. I don't know if it was anxiety or it was kind of it was kind of my first real tryout and 
you know, Musburger's parts aren't, he's not fucking around. You know, it's like, you gotta, you gotta come strong with that shit. It's really good. And, and it was the, I really hadn't like, you know, and I'm in a million bands and I'm playing shows and I'm getting drunk and I'm, you know, and, and I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. And then the morning of like the day of the, of the tryout, I'm still learning. And I only have like two songs down and I have it in my head. I need to have them all down. And I just like, I called John and I said, dude, you know, I'm, I'm kind of stressing out and, you know, I'm not a, the hugest fan of the posies anyway, so I don't really want to stress out. So I just want to wish you guys the best of luck in finding the right guy. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's okay. what I, I mean, it's better than going and wasting their time and embarrassing yourself and having a bad experience. Yeah. Well, what I, what I learned, well, I didn't actually learn this later because I've, I've made the mis same mistake again, just shown up and done it. But, you know, it's okay to just learn two songs really well. Just show up and say, I had time to learn these two. Or it's also okay, hey, could I get another week? Hey, can we do, you know, like, you can probably get some other guys to try out. They didn't, they didn't say, learn these songs. No, it was Joe Bass, you know, he's not like Mr. Fucking Community. Mr. Organization. Yeah. So it was, and he was the, he was the conduit. So it was like, yeah, you know, um, you mean the con don't it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, and it was really interesting because then when Brian got the gig, I can't remember, like, I didn't meet Brian until after I was in green apple. Cause I think they went, they kind of went off and did a bunch of stuff from 95, six, seven, right. They were super busy. And so when I finally met Brian, I was actually, I actually had a gig. Right. And Brian was just, I just loved that guy. He was perfect for that band. And he's like, he's great. Just, yeah. And then, but then he parlayed that thing. I was sort I, I always sort of put together that he parlayed that gig into the fountains of Wayne gig. And that was where I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know if that's you like you yeah. get out there, you play gigs and there will always be more gigs. If, if you show up and play well and you're not an asshole, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if your brain's not broken. Right. Yeah. And but if yeah. you just, yeah. And if you, and if you, if that's what you want, right yeah yeah um but yeah it was uh and then after god you know yeah i thought about them a lot um mostly john because he's he's always been in town but like and i run into him periodically we we emailed a couple times but I, i've only talked to him like that once on the phone and then we emailed a couple times and and then everyone started dying <laughs> you know it's like seeing him a couple it's like you know, I'd love to play with him, but you know, it's like I don't know. He's Does not he... in Seattle now, is he? Where I, I don't know. I thought he was. He's he was in not... Europe. I messaged with him today. I told him. I said, "Hey, uh, what's your guys' tunings on oh, Frosting?" Yeah. Because he's the he's notorious for having. I was the guitarist in his solo band for a tour, and. um you know, every fucking song was in a different tuning. So you'd have to, you know, yeah. yeah. Finger where is he? Your guitar. And where uh, is he? Oh, I don't know. We didn't get into that. I just said, what tuning is a uh, dream all day and uh flavor of the month. Yeah. I'm going to learn those songs and do it for a couch trips. And he said, oh yeah, that's a uh, standard tuning. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, like, all right. Well, John, Thanks yeah. for stopping by. I guess I'm the, uh, the fucking asshole. What's it's not it? the first time. Not the first time. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, you know, uh, Matt Wright, the singer for Gas Huffer, mm -hmm. he was a, a year ahead of me in high school. He was in our, in our high school. And who, uh, oh, uh, Michael DeRozier, drummer for Heart. Woodway High School Jazz Ensemble alum. 
and the only other famous person, Charles Campbell. Sounds like a serial killer. That's the guy. Is he? Yeah. No, really? Yeah. I mean, he's got a serial killer name. Yeah, they put him to death. Yeah. What would he do? Killed folks. Wow. I was a fucking stab in the dark guess. Good one. The I mean the the only blank spot in that is no middle name. Well, that's usually for people who are assassins. Like Charles Charles Riley Campbell. <laughs> or you no, know, he would have it like Charles Arnold Campbell. Like he would right. have like a I guess John Wayne Gacy. I guess he was a serial killer. But you know, Dahmer, but most like, you know, what's a um you know Did you say John Wayne Gretzky? Don't make fun of Wayne Gretzky's name. <laughs> So when, when you got into your first band, because we, we've already established that you were a band nerd, and that's great, so was I, until I discovered rock music and the guitar. Then I was like, fuck you nerds. But, because there was no place for a guitar. There was no jazz band in Granite Falls. Like they were like, jazz? That's for, uh, you know, dope heads and... Uh, city folks we don't want that kind of action around here give us the classics so when you got into a band and you were like all right i'm in a band was that a cover band or, or was your first band like was sledge was an original band it was yeah did you play yeah. the clubs in seattle or were you like we were a seattle band we practiced in fremont you did? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, right, yeah, right in Fremont when it was still right. like, when it was still uh, entirely uh, industrial. Right. There were like, there were no, there was one, you know, there's that that one little mini mart, that like little mini mart that's on Fremont proper, whatever, that, that was there. And that was the only thing there. Right. The red, what's now Pete's, Alehouse, Pete's uh, Tea or whatever, right on the corner of the, yep. the bridge. And that was the red door. And that was like, like a scary bar. Factories. Red Hook was there yeah. um, for a long time. But, you know, you talk about band nerds. The first time I ever drank hard alcohol in public was during marching band with the seniors, senior drummers. The first time I ever smoked pot was with a guy from band who's right. spent the night at, you know, it's like when I was a freshman, there were two full bands, two full jazz ensembles, the one you had to try out for and the, and the one that any could, anybody could be in. Um, and, you know, the first time I ever heard Baba O'Reilly was in band, you know, like our band was amazing. Everybody was, they were all pot smokers and, and, you know, the, the, the valedictorian from 1983 class of Woodway's senior class was, was a tuba player and badass in band. Total stoner. Yeah. So don't out him. What's he's that? Lawyer now. Don't out him. Oh, he's an actor now. He'd love the, he'd love the story. Um, but yes, yeah, Sledge was a, an originals. We played at uh, like the first show we did was at the Rendezvous, the Jewel Box. Nice. When that place was fucking frightening. I still kind of scary. <laughs> no, nope, nope, no. Nope. There was you load in the back door and it was all cardboard boxes to walk on all yeah. the way into the men's bathroom. Yeah. And on the back wall of the men's bathroom, it was just bum diarrhea. Yeah. You're like. It was like that when I showed up in 93. Yeah, so think about it five years earlier. It's just it's like, that was the first time I'm like, holy shit. And then we played the Vogue on the Tuesday night. You know, we played the Squid Row. That was, uh, you used to, what was that place you worked there? 
was Squid Row turned into on Capitol Hill? Like it was a oh yeah, it turned King, into uh, King something. King Cora. King Cora, yeah, yeah. Before that, uh, it was uh, Uncle Rocky's, mm. right? Wasn't it? No, no, Uncle Rocky's was down the down the road. Oh, what was it? Be between I can't Squid remember. Row and and King Cora, it was called. It was had a name, and I played there a bunch of times. Yeah, it was crazy because there were no windows, there was no ventilation, and you yeah. could smoke indoors. So I would go outside and be exhaling cigarette smoke. Um, Those but we played cool. with like we played with uh, Inspector Love there. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we played uh, we played house parties that were really fun. Yeah, but I was I hadn't been in a cover band, which so I didn't know like i didn't know what was okay and i had been on a a like just an enormous diet of neil peart and stuart copeland and i was having this comment so i thought that our so and al tompkins was the bass player and he was in a ton of bands at the time um and i thought he quit because i was so busy um, which always sort of broke my heart because I loved playing with him. He was like, he wasn't necessarily a lead bass player, but he had, he was really a lot of movement, really, nice. really good melodic stuff. A um, little bit of the slap and a little bit of the flea thing because that was what was going on, but not so, but like more dark, not like happy, you know? Um, and it turns out- Eric I, Avery also did a little slapping. Who did? Eric Avery, Eric A from Jane's Addiction like more like Eric Avery you know like like you can't really tell it's slapping it's just like what the hell is that percussive noise yeah yeah um and it helps with the tone too like if you got a kind of a affected tone you know it doesn't come across as a bit you know right. um but uh but the th me and Scott and Al Scott Wade was the bass player um or the guitar player we're we're zooming the other day and it turns out that Al didn't quit the band. He was fired. And you didn't know that. I didn't know that Scott and Dave Weimer, the singer, came in to his job at Kinko's and were like, <laughs> and Al's like, hey, we really just need to talk to Jeff about maybe, maybe like pulling it back just a little bit. You know, could we just have a talk with him? And Dave's like, no, we're going to go a different direction with the bass player. And I'm like, Dave was the leader of the band. <laughs> I didn't know this for the, so long because I was like, I told, I played the, oh geez, okay, this whole thing. We we just got a, uh, we did a couple of recordings. We did one at, at, at the Reciprocal with, yeah. um, with Rich Hinklin who just passed away. Um, and we did one at Electric Eel with Zach Lansdowne. Um, and they're, they're really good. I mean, I'm super impressed considering it's the first time I'd ever played in a band. My meter is good. My fills don't, you know, speed up or slow down or anything. Uh, and we just, Al just found the original uh, quarter inch. Are you guys going to put this shit up on streaming? We might put it out. We might like release it, like put a 45 or something like a, you know. Killer. Yeah, totally. So we're, so we've been going back and forth. I sent it to Duff and I'm like, dude, you got to listen to this. Cause it's like, I was like, please don't get on like it's super super busy and he listened to me, he's like well i guess a little but dude you're it, you're solid the fields yeah. don't slow i mean you like you start it here and it ends here and i'm like hey yeah and so we're i was, I was telling al that i had told duff that yeah this guy quit he's like i didn't quit i'm like what he's like i didn't quit I'm like what happened i got fired i quit the but band he like paid he, he didn't get fired he got kicked out you got the stepping in my office. I quit the band like a month later because we tried out one bass player and I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? It was a person who was like their first band. It was all down picking and like, sort of like way more like, you know, ACDC and right. I'm used to, I'm used to this fucking rhythmic machine happening that I can play off. And now I've got, Oh, do, 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 do. I just didn't, I didn't understand it. And now I love that kind of bass playing. I totally get it. Backbeat, super fun. But at the time I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to sound really busy on top of that. 
<laughs> so I quit the band. I, I didn't want to be in a band. They're that. like, we need a guy that plays the bass like Cliff. Right. And, yeah. and that's when you know you're next. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we weren't a cover band. It was all originals. Have you never heard it? No, man. You gotta send this to me. I want to hear this. Yeah, it's it's pretty I know that you're capable of sending it to me. You just told me you to send it to your famous friend. Oh well, you never ask. Well, I did uh, you, you know. You don't I'm know so what cool. you don't know. You want to play it right now? No. Screw you then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be put on the spot. Right. Oh, this is great, Jeff. Oh my God. Oh, oh, I like what you've done. This is some of your best early work. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so you quit. Did you already have something lined up or what would you do? What happened? Well, uh, you know, I made a conscious decision that I didn't want to be in a band with people who were down in C. Like I wanted to, I, I don't know. I, I, I remember having this thought that it was all really new. There were only about 45 people doing it. You know, it seemed like at the time, you know, and that I wanted to like, I always thought like, I want to be in a band. I want to start a band with guys I went to high school with and make it, you know, like I want that to be our story. Right. And I'd always played with Steve Caldwell, who I went to high school with and we'd always jammed since like he was the first guy we had, we had some riffs we would always jam on, but we never really made them into songs, but we'd, had like you know half a dozen of them, and he some he'd play on bass and some he'd play on on, uh, on keyboards. And so I got him, and I was looking for Joe Van Hollebeck, this guy I went to high school with. And I'm like, that's our singer, because he was like class clown, funniest guy, you know, like the. Right. And I'm like, and he, you know, and I'm like, that's the guy I want to be our singer. And I, it took me a year to find him. In the meantime, I put together this band with Steve and this guitar player from Shoreline Community College um, and this bass player I knew who was super into playing we would always get together and play moving pictures together that was like what we did right. um, and um, and the singer was this guy from a band called Big Naked who was like you know from before he was like six years older than us but you know uh and we did that. That was the band that was going that we that Johnny and those guys came over and helped us do the recording during the cave fish cave fish times. Uh -huh. So like Tony, like I found Tony during that time um, and started that process. And and then one day Guy on a Punch <laughs> was was the name of the band with Steve Caldwell and the and the guy from Shoreline and Big Naked Dude. And our first gig was the open mic at the Lions Lair. Very nice. And I don't know the Lions Lair. Yeah, yeah, over in Green Lake there. Oh, I don't over, know this place. Did you say you don't know it? No. Oh, it was up on uh, Aurora, just above Green Lake. Hmm. Um, nice area back then. Yeah, well, it was all kind of shitty, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but uh, we were on our way there. Our house was on 137th and Aurora, uh, uh, Greenwood. Uh -huh. So we're on our way up and we stop at the, we stop 145th in Greenwood. There's that AM PM. Yeah. And I pull in there, I got a Volkswagen bus and we got all our stuff in there. And it's me and Caldwell. And we're like, we're going to our first gig and get out to get some gas. And I go to pay for it. And Joe Van Hollebeck is working at the AM PM. And he's got long hair and fuzzy chest and beads. And he's all like, you know, shoes and no socks and just like shorts and just like barely gives me the time of day i'm like dude i've been looking for you man we're in a band we're doing this thing we're going to he's like that's cool man like giving me <laughs> nothing nothing i'm like you know, looking back i'm like just give me your phone number man i was just too I, I, I wasn't gonna but looking back he was like just giving us such attitude for the guy who was basically pumping our gas at the amp right but he but we called him I don't know why he was being so aloof in the initial meeting, but we put together a band immediately and that was the end of Kind of Punch. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just right. so funny. That's cool, man. 
Yeah. That's cool. I, I, I'm, I'm reading a book here at work, so if you could just keep it down. If you could just fuck off to your little gig. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically, right? Your little open mic. Yeah. It was a pretty horrible gig. We just didn't realize it. Maybe he did. Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, have a good time. Hey, do a good <laughs> show, all right? <laughs> do, do a good three right? songs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah what was the let me uh so green apple was the first the first gig that you had where you went on tour yeah i got in muzzle for like three months did you tour first. no we uh not not real touring in fact we didn't actually do real touring in in, uh, in green apple we uh like muzzle got we got they said you're the guy go get a drum set and I got a drum set and all the stuff I needed to tour. And then they said, you're not the guy, but you can keep all the stuff. I'm like, okay. And then like a month later, I was in Green Apple. And that that lasted like a year while the record was supposed to come out. They just finished making one. And we were just, you know, we'd go up to Vancouver. We'd go to Eastern Washington. We'd go to Portland. We did a, we played some shows in New York just to, you know, showcase for trying to get a booking agent or, and we, Went to Los Angeles a few times, filmed a couple of videos, one video, and did the release for the. We did a. We were on a soundtrack, so we did, went down and played the, you know, the premiere and all this stuff. But the record never came out, and we never got tour support, and we never went on the road. And that, and then it was back to being in like seven bands. That's. So wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that New American Shame was the first band that you went on and you toured with? yeah yeah wow well you know for longer than you know four dates yeah yeah i mean those are trips those uh, you know those aren't yeah. those aren't tours right yeah no new american shame was the first band i drove across the country with yeah right yeah and i knew i knew those guys for i didn't know any of those guys when i got in the band and that band was like fucking pirates it was like I was like, that bus was like a pirate ship. Yeah, yeah, that was a good time. It was a, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. It's It wasn't the first time I'd been in a band where I was the guy who I didn't know anybody. Right. You know, it's like, you definitely get that chameleon thing down pretty good as a, as a, as a drummer, I guess, you know, like just not consciously fitting in but like subconsciously fitting in you know right um, but you know there's just as long as you're good and you kill it and you don't like you hold down your end it's pretty you're probably okay to go but yeah that was that was the first time and those guys were those guys fucking meant it you know like i'd never been in, in an unabashed rock band before right you know it's like they're not fucking around they're like the singer's crazy and has a chance to offer a voice. Non-ironic rock band. Nothing it ironic. Was, it was so fun. <laughs> it was so fun. It's not the kind of music, my favorite kind of music to play. You know, it's like, I, I'm a big fan of Groove. And honestly, I really wish I would have met Dick Rossetti before that. So I, so I would have been able to, I, I would have known the, the concept of backbeat. Right. You know? Cause I didn't, I was still just, you know, in my, I just, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know, I didn't know that that was a thing. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you why Bill Rudd was so great or why, you know, Charlie Watts is so great. I just knew that they're, the, the music swung really well, but they didn't seem to be doing very much, you know. That's, that's it, right? You know yeah. what? Here's the thing: when you when I go back and listen to ACDC now, like critically, the transitional parts, like even though sure, like just cruising along Highway to Hell, it's like here it goes, right? But the the you know the four beats on either side of a transition completely make the song and the transition into a bridge or a chorus or a pre-chorus or whatever it's fucking ing and phil rudd is the master 
it's 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 miraculous like the way he almost every time flips the beat around and you can't tell right. like he'll flip it around and then but it's still straight and and like backbeat yeah it's but... crazy it's crazy it's not fair it's not fair it's because it, like growing up all the drummers and band were like phil rudd sucks right you know even it's the same like, thing all the time no, you know he's no he's no peter he's no peter chris <laughs> it's like but the but the truth of the matter is there's probably got one kick drum what a wiener right right there's probably no better rock drummer ever it's possibly true you know i'd say he's he's, he's got to be on the podium you know as far as like did he get in some trouble he did get in some trouble <laughs> Yeah. So he's also got a lot of character. It sounds like maybe he had been uh, dipping his nose into some funny powders. By yeah, the perhaps. Theater. Perhaps. I think they have that in Australia, don't they? They have it everywhere, yeah. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. apparently it was something like a... It was some sort of dirty deeds scenario, wasn't it? <laughs> so, I think so. So yeah. I, I forgot all about that till we started talking about him. You brought yeah, um, great person. pick up the pick up the phone, leave him alone, <laughs> or make a social call. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I heard that. I don't. I can't remember if it, I think that might have run through though. Yeah, because I think he's was he, is he back in the band? I thought he was. Yeah. 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 You brought up. Um, Dick Rosette. Yeah. Rick Caesar. Rick Caesar. <laughs> How fucking great is Dick Rosetti, though? Reg Slade. <laughs> what? Really? Oh, what do you mean? Of course. I don't know that one. Oh, dude, Reg Slade. I don't know that. Yeah. Which, uh, which incarnation of his rock acts did you play with because you played with one of them right did you play with comb over or squirt? no I, I just did the squirt uh reunions oh yeah yeah was that but like I, one of your joys of life yeah um and but also like and I, you know i would never tell him this so dick plug your ears um but like you know and I wouldn't use the word intimidating, but it was like you re you definitely want to impress or I don't even think you can impress Dick because he's so unimpressible. Well, here's but the thing is, like he might quietly be impressed with something, but he it's not really in his skill set to to gush about anything. So he, I see that I, I don't think that's true. If you like the eyebrows and like dick has a way of letting you know with very few words if any if something pleases or displeases him yeah uh, yeah and he's fucking incredible and so yeah. you you want to do you want to do good for him yeah for sure yeah bless him um and the fact that uh electric vivi rourke mm. you know that that was a you know, he played on the first Loaded album. He played really? on Dark, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that was just like, that was a dream come true. That was almost as good as playing in front of the cult. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think back on the cult tour now, I'll bet you if I would have asked towards the end of the tour at some point, they would have let me sit in on a song. Really? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I think that I like made a good enough, uh, a big enough impression, <laughs> you know, although right. Sorum, I'm not sure Sorum's given up the chair for anybody. Was Sorum drumming with him then? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, it was, it was, it was uh, Billy and Ian and uh, Sorum and Martine Lenoble. I don't know who that is. He is the uh, spiky blonde haired guy from Porno for Pyros. Oh yeah, 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 of course. He wrote he wrote the song. He wrote Pets. Oh. That was his uh I listened to that song this morning. All right, yeah. I heard it at the dentist yesterday. Nice. 
<laughs> it's it's weird 50, 50 cents from our time. We're there. Yeah. Um, and then Mike Dimkich was the second guitar player. It was like, and and uh, Mike Fasano, Sack, Sack was the drum tech. Right. So that was just the great dude. That like, that was everything could have come to a screeching halt life wise after that. I'd have been fine. Right. That was so like the the, the cult. The cult was one of my, still is one of my all time favorite bands. And, yeah. you know, in the late eighties, it was like a rock band that like, oh, there's still rock bands, you know, when, when electric. Oh yeah. That was like, as, that was as good as ACDC to me, you know, but it was new. And yeah, they were, they were good. And they, what was nice about that tour is they, they didn't have a record out. It was like, I think it was their first tour back after they got sober and they were just trying to get a record deal. So they just went out and played the hits. That's, isn't that nice? It's amazing. I listened to Sanctuary 32 times. 10 weeks, I had never missed, never missed them right. playing that song. It's amazing. Yeah, that's pretty great. Yeah. That is pretty fucking great. Yeah. What? So that was the first tour? Did you guys... No, we did we did uh, ten weeks with Local H. Oh yeah. And then on and off, like, and ten then after weeks. That was your yeah. your first tour was ten weeks. It it was longer than that. We did ten weeks with Local H, and then we started going like we did a bunch of dates with Kid Rock. We did a b bunch of dates with uh, Buck Cherry, and then we'd go back with with local age and we just we were out in the you know just that side of texas and above and we were just like okay where are we going next where are we going next you know we'd wait for the next call to come in and like okay back to texas so okay back to florida four months away from home yeah yeah let me ask you this since that was your first tour and i'm certain that there was something that you grossly underestimated and some things that you grossly overestimated. What what were the first big takeaways that you you made? Like, oh shit, I should have, I didn't need this many pairs of pants. And uh I need to get a bigger CD book because we all had CD books back then, right? Yeah. Um you know, I don't remember, I don't remember being caught off guard positively or negatively by anything. I do remember on the rider, Kelly and I were splitting a bottle of vodka for about the first two weeks. And after that, we realized we were going to need our own. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a that's learning lesson. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I don't think Here's a funny one. I'm not sure I've ever had a competent drum tech on any tour I've ever done. Somehow. Somehow it's always been like, it's been a thing where, oh, we're saving money and well, this guy will double, you know, like this guy will be some of both. And you know, and it's like you, the drummer always gets screwed. Um, but, you know, if that was going to be the worst thing that happened, I was, we were playing clubs and small theaters i was it's cool with me you know um um the very first thing that happened was we we drove the first gig we played was with liz fair and local h at some college downtown chicago mm -hmm. and i'd never heard of local h and i watched a bunch of their set and then we were gonna like chicago's a different a different town oh yeah you, know, you can you can uh but I heard them play High Five and Motherfucker. And I'd heard that song on KCMU like three years earlier. Yeah. And I was like, this is them? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't realize I was on tour with a band that had, I, you know, that I'd heard their music before. On the um, radio even. I'd never, I'd never seen the video, but, but KCMU played, I'd, I'd heard that song. 
Um, but then we got to like, so before, before we went on, me and Kelly ran down to this bar and we were sitting at the bar and we're talking to the bartender. We're like, yeah, we're in this band. And like, obviously we look like we're in a band because we're about to go on. And actually those were the clothes we wore, whatever. But the bartender's like, oh, sh after, come back afterwards. We're like, okay. And so afterwards we go back to that bar and there's some guys with us and one of them's underage. And we like go in and we're like, I, I suppose our underage guy can't come in, can he? He's like, oh yeah, bring him in, it's cool. The door guy's a, a cop and he's just off, off duty. So everything goes down, we'll just shuffle him out quick. Like, okay, cool, weird. And then he's like, you wanna see the place? And it's like, so it, it was a club and had a, a back room. And we, the guy takes us in the back room and it's like this giant where you would, uh, um, it's where you would uh, like have a band or a DJ or whatever, giant room. In the middle of the room, there's this like a, a, a bar table with bar stools around it, six cops sitting around having some adult sodas. Hmm. I'm like, oh, cops having drinks Just in the middle of the day. <laughs> you know, it, it was, I'm like, I was like, oh yeah, well, and you know, we just like to serve them. So if anything happens here, they know who we are. We've got the greases, the palms greased. And she's like, holy shit, we are not in Seattle anymore. That's pretty old school right there. Yeah, yeah, like, and they stay open till four. And, you know, if like we stay, we'll stay open as long as we want, as long as our guy at the door is a cop. So, you know, if, if somebody complains, then it goes to that cop and not, you know, everybody, everybody's on the take. and. It's just like, holy wow. Jesus, we are not in Kansas, man. Um, and then, you know, I don't know. Did you travel other... as a kid? What's that? I'm going to take just a brief side step. Did yeah. you travel any as a kid with your family or on band trips or anything? like, Or was touring and music travel the first real travel out of the Northwest that you did? Well... I was, uh, so I was born in New York and uh, lived in Pennsylvania and my parents took us across the country in a van um, in the early 70s. I remember just a little bit of it. Um, but then, and then we moved to Huntington Beach and from there we like drove down to Mexico a couple of times for, my dad was working at Road and Track, the magazine, and they were we went down there and covered a hang gliding festival and hung out and we drove up to out to uh, Joshua tree and we go camping. Um, and then when we came up here, we drove up here from California. So I remember the, you know, the first trip up the I-5 corridor. Um, and then as a kid, my mom and I flew back to, I mean, we didn't drive, but we flew back to New York for, couple of weeks to hang out with family mm -hmm. um you know we would go camping a little bit me and friends in high school would go places but not like i mean what do you like i i i hadn't been all over the place i hadn't been out of the well i've been to vancouver but i hadn't been out of the country i've been to mexico yeah. but but um but so the band, uh, so in high school band, we would like, uh, the jazz band would go down to the Moscow, uh, you know, University of Moscow, University of Idaho in Moscow. We go to the jazz festival there. We would go to all over the state playing, uh, doing parades. Um, but so when you go to Chicago and you have this experience on your first big tour, it's pretty like it cracks your brain basically like an egg well like, you know the thing oh, is that i was this... i was already i was already 30 you know right. by the time you know i it was 99 so i'm 31 look you can be 50 and be naive to the fact that that kind of shit is happening like you see it in movies and on yeah. tv cop shows but to see it in yeah. person is a is another <laughs> level yeah I just don't know that I was blown away by it. I was just like, this is fucking rad. Right. You know, <laughs> like, but I mean, you gotta, that band, we were about 35 minutes 
East on the 90 when Terry and Kelly dropped acid. <laughs> on like, your first trip out of town? Dude, we're like, yeah. And and so, you know who Brian Rowe is? Ye- Guitar tech extraordinaire. Yeah, of course. Brian Rowe, right? Yeah. He, I met him the day we left for tour. And the first thing he said was said to me was, yeah, okay, get your ass in the van. And I'm like, and I didn't know him from Adam. And like, you know, now we love that guy to death. Right. And about halfway through the tour we did, but like initially it was like, what the? And then Kelly and Terry take acid immediately. And I'm like, I guess the ride has begun. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's fucking great. Yeah, we would like, just we would take acid like kelly and i we'd get to somewhere that was like uh like the night before a show van van touring and in the middle of nowhere and kelly and i would just set off for a bar we tr- we're gonna go find a bar nobody else wanted to we'd go find a bar we found this bar that was like four rooms of country music country music line dancing country music karaoke and country and western karaoke and we walk in there and it's like a high school like a that sounds like a great place for a couple of fucking weirdos like you to get your asses kicked well so we walk in and it's like that scene where you're walking up to the table to give the definitely in missouri right it was somewhere in the south man and and we walk up looking like us and they're like there's a cop standing right there. He's like, so uh, are you guys looking for trouble? It's the first thing he says to us like, no, we're just looking for some drinks, man. He's like, okay, come on in then. <laughs> and we like, we check out all these rooms and it's like, wow, okay. And so we, we have our couple of pops or whatever and we way across the parking lot, there's like a diner. So we walk over there and Kelly's like, we should take acid. I'm like, you're a moron, <laughs> you're a fucking moron. It's three it's two in the morning he's like let's take acid i'm like dude you're a moron give it to me and so we take acid at two in the morning right you know it's like it was that just sort of we're on the ride we want to feel the ride right you know so how was the show the next day that's a tough time to get started on uh you know as i think of it now we i don't know if we had a show well we had to get the van in I had to drive first thing in the morning, but I'll tell you, I've never seen someone have such a positive reaction to Gatorade before. <laughs> Kelly was like, Kelly was hit, is how the, that's what the terminology we would use. He was, or what he would say is shit and shoved in it. Yeah. Um, and he got there and someone got him a, a Gatorade and it almost, it figuratively brought him back from the dead. Right. It's amazing. Show is fun. There's something about getting on stage that even if you're hung over, like it's fine. There's it's like fine. an adrenaline rush that happens and you you get through it, you limp through it and Kelly thrived. Drink it all. Yeah. I'm so I'm so happy that I don't drink. Oh god. Yeah. I got no he business just, drinking he would, he would just bang his head until um until the euphoria set in and he would be fine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he was fun to be in a band with. What a fucking crew. Yeah. Yeah. He, do you talk to him still? Uh yep. He's gonna come over on uh Monday and uh take a look at my roof. Oh great. How's he doing? He's uh, he's doing good. He's good. He uh you know, he and his uh, lovely wife Kathleen had a house over in West Seattle that they sold uh about a year before the pandemic that they did and, uh, good. Before bought a place went out what's that before the bridge went out and and prices tabled yeah before that and he uh they went out to the peninsula and bought a place um got a big spread out there and he's got a sweet rock room he, him, and, him and elliot freed the drummer guy are mm-hmm. making a record out there awesome yeah and i talked to paulson pretty often He's writing, he's wrote a book and starting a second one. Wow. Yeah. Fiction, nonfiction. What is it? Um, the first one I think is fiction. I think it's like a novel. Wow. Yeah. That guy's just a 
talented guy. Like, I'll bet it's, I would guess that it's good just from knowing him. I would think. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, looking forward to getting a copy. Do you ever consider writing on a grander scale? Because you are, you're good with words, uh, written words. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yes, short answer. You want a long answer? <laughs> yeah, do you, goes, have, it, do you have a concept? It goes better for the podcast if it's more than one word, Jeff. Yeah, um, it does. It's a uh, great interviewing. Yeah, uh, just the other, well, like, so um, I've got, like, so nonfiction, I mean, my whole story is is inspiring as, you know, I'm the most fortunate person you've ever met in your life, and I can choose any portion of my life, and it's just like, that happened? Lucky you. Um, um, and then I also came up with a, I've got a science fiction one that I think it'd be pretty great about it's be impossible to you know give you the thumbnail sketch but um but the the most recent one i thought would be fun is like just i've been coming at, like trying to take snippet timelines from my life and i think the part where where my dad my dad rode his motorcycle from pennsylvania across the country once he got the job at road and track secured us a house and bought a new Volkswagen bus and picked us up from the airport. We were there from 72 and then his department closed in 74 and he came up here and did basically did the same thing. And I think that time period would be pretty fun to, to look at just because it was so, it's so uh, historically rich with, I mean the 70s, it's the fucking 70s in Huntington Beach but then to contrast it with the fucking 70s in Edmonds, Washington, Seattle, Washington, we would go, you know, the, the park that's right at the end of the, at the market? Yeah. My dad took us there one time. He worked in the terminal sales building. Um, and so one day, I don't know, it was in the 76, 77, whenever it was, he's like, we're going to have a picnic there. And we go down there and it's like seagulls, only they're bums. And yeah. we just get overrun with bums trying to get some food. <laughs> you yeah. basically get, you know, like gotta pack up and in a hurry and shuffle the kids to the car. <laughs> yeah, it's just like Seattle was like, nobody moved there on purpose. You ended up there. Right. You know? Boeing was already, Boeing was in full swing. Sure. Yeah. Outside yep. of that, it was like fishing, and and the port wasn't what it was, what it is rather. Right. No, it was the last. It was the last stop before you were forced to go to Alaska to go fishing. Or, yeah, or just you know. go build a cabin off the grid and disappear, and you know, become whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a, yeah, I talked to uh, Regan Hagar about this on our, on our little, the little dog and pony show that we do. And he was like, uh, he had a term for it and I can't remember what it is. So you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> great, great, yeah. great. But job. it was a farming community, you know, it was a farming community with one multinational and one university, basically one yeah. real couple five story buildings. Really, you know, you had the Weston buildings, you had the, the twin Westons and, right. you know, what was the, I mean, I think when we moved here, I think there was only one building taller than the Space Needle. And that was the the dark one that's like got the, the top like this. Yeah. You know, it was before the Columbia Center, but before any of that stuff, you know, it's like, I think that the Smith Tower was still on the podium of tall buildings. Right. You know, it's just like, there's nothing here. You know. Um, so you guys talk about a lot of old Seattle on your podcast. We do, yeah. Um I Regan is the perfect example. Um where I've known him for 30 years, but 
I didn't know. You don't get the chance to. Nobody. It's so. Uh, it's so frowned upon in Seattle to share your experiences because it comes across as bragging. Right. You know, because if you were here in 1980 working at the Showbox and happen to be in a band with fucking Andy Wood, you can't say that out loud because people would be like, oh, weren't you cool? Rockstar. Yeah. Fucking you asshole. Know? No, there's, right. a, there's something inherent about being in Seattle in the 80s and, and you know, mid, early 90s that is like, you don't brag about things. You don't do anything flashy. You don't show off. You don't play hot guitar solos. You yeah. slack, right? Well, no, you don't slack. You just don't brag about it. You work right. your you ass have, off, you and you, and secretly, slack. and secretly, you want it, right? But you know, but you don't, you don't, you don't talk about don't prop like you want it. Yeah, I think that's all. I'm not going to talk about it, but yeah, yeah. It's a very but, aloof thing that was going on in Seattle, where everyone was clamoring for a record deal. But everyone was like, I'm not in it for the record deal, man. Well, that's your boy. You know, I think Mr. Cobain was the was the king of that right. and the most successful on both where he's like, you're telling me you don't want to be famous. You're telling me, you know, like, I don't know if I buy all that, but I think that that's where it started. What is like, you know, the the top of the pyramid was sort of, you know, showing people how it should be done. Right. And people listened, you know, it's like, well, you, that, you know, that, uh, that the, the Pearl Jam 20 documentary, I thought that was probably the most interesting and honest part was when they're talking with Stone and he says, if we're good now, a lot of it's because of his early criticism of us. Right. And we, and he definitely kept us on our best behavior. You know, like we really had to question why we were doing things we were doing. And I think that's, you know, if you go back and look at a lot of the Nirvana uh, press and like interviews and stuff like that, they're really condescending. They're so, like the whole thing is kind like of this. A cock. What? He was kind of a cock. Like, and the whole camp permeated that, you know? And yeah, it's really interesting. But that, you know, so like not even Pearl Jam was uh, immune. Right. You know, and yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, how do we, what, what did you, what started that? Oh, we were talking about, uh, about your podcast. Oh, right, right, right. And not, yeah. And so. Gen X attitude. Yeah. And, and, you know, 30 years in where, Boy, it seems like more people who won the lottery are are not here than are here. Right. Um, like now, it's a matter of sort of documenting history, you know. Um, and I like I knew of a lot of the stories that Regan had to tell, but I didn't. I certainly had never heard them, like from the horse's mouth, and I just. I want to know him. I want to know, like, I I want to. I want to know him. Like, I want to know that 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 Regan was in Mother Love Bone until Greg Gilmore showed up, and then was like, and then Regan's re Regan's reaction is, is he going to be in your band? <laughs> like, there was no animosity whatsoever. He's like, well, if he'll be in the band, you'll take him, right? Because he's because he was fucking Greg Gilmore. You know, it's like. It's just, a, I never knew that. That's, you know, just nobody now could even fathom that because that's what it was like back then. It's like, it wasn't like, oh, you're taking money off my table. It was like, oh my God. Yeah. It, it was like, oh my God, you have the greatest drummer anyone's ever seen in this city wants to be in your band. Right. You know, it's like, yeah. I mean, stories like that are just like, that's, I don't know. I, I think it's a uh, it's really fun to let people tell their stories also with, with in a in a place where they're where we're just talking, right. nobody's bragging, you know. It's like I'm super interested in finding out 
you know, how it went for people and how they felt about it and what their perspective was and what their perspective was then and how it's changed and, you know. Because yeah. most certainly it has. In some cases, but not in all. And, and yeah, it has only because the industry's changed. Like most of these stories are pre-industry, you right. know. They're like, they're not, you know, we were talking about the 10 minute warning. Um, nobody was thinking, they were like the first band to be elevated to possibly being a national act, you know, nobody, they, but they didn't know really what to do with it exactly because nobody from Seattle had ever done that before. Right. You know, Heart. just that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Heart, but you know, but not, not from the underground, not from the, yeah. Certainly not from the punk world. Yeah. 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 So that's what we do. And I don't think it's always going to be that we had mirror gloss on. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're, uh, what's that? Yeah. They're from Tacoma. They're, they're amazing. Um, we're not just doing what Seattle was. We're, we're, that's just what we've done. Things called Seattle today, kind of ironically, Mm -hmm. because we didn't think we could get the name, but we did. (laughs) uh, Apparently it's a, it's a dead trademark with King five. Oh. So we're like, well, at least maybe they'll have to come buy it back from us at some point. <laughs> well, then we'll make some money, Mike. <laughs> right. So um, how did how did you guys come to get that fancy location? And can you talk about that? Or is it still sneaker it? It's not sneaker it. We're, uh, so um, Dan, the engineer, our engineer, and uh, he used to be front of house yeah. at the Moore. And Steve Martin, my uh, compadre, um he is the uh uh house manager yeah stage manager he's worked for stg forever right. um and um you know it's been covid so there's not been a bunch of stuff going on um <laughs> we, we we try and make sure that uh, everybody who comes in does some uh public service announcements for stg uh-huh. um and we uh try and stg uh, our friend angela um tries to buy things from like a memorabilia for anybody who comes by um like um we'll get them to sign stuff that stg can use for their um the auction they do to uh do the kids uh kids programs um so you know we're just uh we're just trying to be as helpful to them as we can be and they've just you know we're you know we're not in their way and Steve is, you know, Steve and Dan are beloved on their side. So at least for the moment, you guys are set up on the stage while you're doing this, right? Mm-hmm. Do, is there any talk of you guys incorporating bands playing on the show? It's hmm. a great idea, Mike. Um, yeah, well, we've talked about it. We've yeah. certainly talked about it. Um, it would, uh, you know, the short answer is yes. Uh, nothing would make us happier. Right. Um, that's a little bit more uh, involved, obviously, than yeah. setting up a, a, a couple of stages and uh, and especially during COVID, it's like you know we're not like there, we're only three guys and you can't have more than five or six or something. You know, like right. we couldn't do that until they're allowed to you know start you know reconvening. Or right. convenient. Yeah. Have you gotten any of your vaccine shots, by the way? Uh, Monday, I'm getting my first one. I got my first one this last Monday. I'm very happy. That where'd they put it, Mike? So it's kind of a private question. Well, I've I've just heard a lot of people getting uh they're not really it's like a it's a it's sort of a, it's a scam just for because they're I don't know. Show me on the doll where they put it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's right. Uh, right in the shoulder. Right in the shoulder. Yeah. Oh! Kapow. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, it's it's pretty fun doing a podcast, isn't it? Uh, I enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoy do, it a lot. Do you like it more or about what you were expecting to? You just froze. Oh, yeah. You did too. Uh, Is that all you get? 
I don't know. I don't know what the fuck is going on. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can now. Yeah. Um, do you like it more than or about as much as you thought you would? Because I'll, because you're really good at it and because you are a socially comfortable person and that's what it takes. Um, do you like uh, it more than you were expecting to? Um, do, 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 do. Uh, do I like it more than I was expect? Do I like it more than I expected to like it? Yeah. Do, does does the experience exceed your expectations that you had beforehand? Or uh, um, he, well, I'll tell you what. So the one with Regan that we did was the first time I felt like when we were done, I got home and I felt like I'd played a show. Right. Like I was amped. It yeah. was. I was like, that was fucking great. Like, like just realizing what all had transpired. Right. That, we set the bar pretty high. I'm not saying that I haven't felt. They're all pretty great. They're all like a lot. But like that was the first one with a guest. Like Steve and I and Dan get together, and, and I love doing those. And that's more about like me and Steve have been known each other for so long. We're we're hilarious and just talk shit to each other. Right. Um, but having someone on you guys broadcast for people who are listening, you guys live stream those. Some of them, yeah. yeah. And we're gonna do one probably tonight. We're gonna do one actually, yeah. Oh, awesome. But you won't have this on by then. So you can just oh. edit the part out. Oh. Or I can have Dan edit. Send this okay. over, I'll have Dan. Dan, will you edit this out? All right, great. <laughs> Don't worry, we're gonna edit most yeah. of this out. Totally. Um yeah, um, but yeah, I've wanted to do it for a long time. I've wanted to do it for a while. Um, but I just, you know, you, I'm super proud of you for like getting it done because it's, it's really difficult. It's, it's not like, it's not just this part, this part's the easy, yeah. it's the, it's the editing and then figuring out where you put it up and like Dan scheduling, scheduling tests, that's not hard for me. Like I can do that all day long. That's, that's again, that's my, that's in my, that's my toolbox is like i've been doing that for my whole life and that's you know we've got a list of people that we can't even get to yet but um but and, and dude for you you can do it on, like we have to have them at the more or come or or come to the three trees podcast studio here um like if i could do it online it'd be quite a bit easier um i wish i had a space that i could go to and right. I definitely wish I had an editor. I, yeah. I, if if what you're saying is you envy my position at, from for doing this at home, I would say to you th that I also envy your position. And it's, no. and, yeah. and what a great situation you guys have set up. I'm super stoked that you're doing it. And I really enjoy the podcast. Yeah. Um. It's. Uh. I think. Uh. I don't think I'm saying I envy you. <laughs> Only because here's what I was thinking is like, as soon as bands start coming through, like I'm gonna, like Local H has got a whole tour booked, gonna be here in October. Come on, stop by the Moore Theater. Let's get you on there for an hour. You know, um, I think it'll be a lot. And I think it'll be, it's sort of a, to have that as the venue, is pretty badass. What do you know what the scenario will be? Is is the Moore Theater too large of a venue that because of the capacity it will be slower to open back up to shows? I don't I don't know. I don't know. Right. I'm not sure. Um you guys can always go to the jewel box. For for what? <laughs> if the more is booked you just go down the block oh, oh, the oh if the more is booked yeah. right well and that's gonna that's gonna happen is that the more is gonna be booked you know as soon as that comes back well it's definitely gonna be like okay now what do we do but but i mean my room here is pretty great and we have all the gear it's all you know um it's not the more theater but um yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. For now, it's okay. For now, it's a positive. Nice. My plan is 
to tour the podcast so that that's the deal is like that's why it started to begin with is because dan and dan and steve were working these um these gigs at the Moore theater where these jagoffs would come through the podcast and sell out three nights in a row right and they're like those guys are morons we're funnier than them and so they started it with this 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 other guy that they worked with um and it just didn't work out it wasn't like you know it was just the dynamic wasn't right right and then steve called me and i'm like yeah let's hook up and and that but that's their impetus i'm like if that happens, that'd be lovely. Um, I'm all in on that. I'm not waiting around for it. Nobody's like, we're not like waiting to cash checks. We're not like, you yeah, know, of course. If it happens, you know, do you have an idea of how many followers slash like, when does that, what do you need as far as an audience to make that a reality? I don't know. I'm not going to. I'm not going to base it on how many streams the podcast gets though, because my intention is to do it. I'll do it in New York for a while in Brooklyn. And uh, it'll basically be a low rent talk show. I'll be in front of an audience with a guest. We'll do the podcast. I'll have a group, a band house band. And then we'll, uh, play five or six songs and the whole thing is over in two hours tops it's audio huh sounds expensive for who me for who's ever renting the renting the the venue and paying the band yeah well financing is something yeah (laughs) the whole thing that's why we have Patreon. Okay. How does uh, that work? Patreon, do you do, do pretty well on there? I mean, it allows me to pay Don Gunn to mix this music for me, you know? Right. Which, you know, let's face it, my videos would be much, much less good. They'd be a lot, they'd be very shitty without good sounding audio. And also that would take up, that would occupy a lot of my time right. and it would, you know, yeah. So for a long time, I grabbed the reins and I, everything, I was just like, I can, I'm doing everything. And then I was like, oh, wait, Fuck I'm, not, I'm not the best at doing this. Right. Someone, someone good should be doing it. And right. uh, so, you know, as I can afford it, I will always farm that work out before I pay myself anything because that's the deal. Yeah, You want it to be good. And once it's really good, then hopefully people are paying attention still. But the idea... Emphasis on paying. Yeah, that's right. Uh, The idea is I, I roll into a town, my guest is local, my band is also local. Oh. I show up with two camera guys and an audio guy. I no, I I don't think it's all that bad. Like there are a lot of people that you don't have to rehearse to play five, six songs. Like you play them at sound check and you're, and so I'll, I'll run it. Like I do couch riffs, talk to someone, hang out that we have a Q and a maybe with the audience. And then we play five or six songs with the band and then boom see you later it's right. over yeah pick up a t-shirt at the door please yeah for pay <laughs> or for dollars yeah they're they're 25 dollars. thank you they're, they're 65 dollars. yeah <laughs> yeah uh, and they're small so that's the idea yeah yeah well best of luck with that yeah thanks yeah well uh maybe you know Maybe uh, maybe we'll cross paths. You guys will pl- be playing the Enormo Dome. <laughs> or the, the Amormo Dome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I think that the, uh, that, the, the, from this side, from, from what these fellas are 
envisioning the less the better like it's 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 actually more like this yeah like where it's just like uh i i've I've thought the idea of like having the guest be local that makes a ton of sense yeah um but the the part where you got a rental car oh i'm not doing a car you're flying in you're flying out you know yeah yeah but i don't know i it's not my that's not my end of it right i'm like i like talking to people i'll talk to anybody anywhere um if it happens, if it ends up, I don't, what, is it going to happen? Probably not. But hey, if it does, I'll go along for the ride. You know, who, who knows? Like, why even bother allowing, is it going to happen? Probably not into your mind. Is it going to happen? I don't know. Is it? <laughs> Maybe it is definitely well, maybe well if it does it'll happen for me that's all i know so i just i like to talk poorly about it just so i don't seem like a braggart definitely if it if it happens it's because i'm great <laughs> it's like i'm not saying it won't happen for you i'm just saying i'm amazing so <laughs> we can just leave it at that that'd be i mean you know. <laughs> uh i'm also i'm excited to to have you drumming on an episode so am i i'm really excited about it and it's a fucking burner of a tune yep really excited about it i had this fantasy that i would it would be the first episode that i did not appear in at all and that it would be staffed by uh all the parts in the song we won't say what the song is but every everyone would be known primarily as a drummer and i would release it this month as a part of drummer awareness month but i don't think that's gonna happen i don't mind the part of you not playing on it fuck you (laughs) i don't want a bunch of drummers on my track (laughs) but i just seem like the hat drummer who can only drum i already told you i already told you i want to sing one you're like no you play the drums on one (laughs) we'll just do a drum one first i'm like what i didn't know there was a a prerequisite there's like a there's like a a buy-in and you have to play drums on one i wanted it to be all drummers i thought i think that would be great for drummer awareness i'm not this isn't enough what what, just making yourself aware are you aware (laughs) of what i I can't be certain (laughs) i probably not probably well, I'm I'm really excited. About it. Is this on? I don't know. I'm, I'm not. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm about to pee my pants. Well, go ahead. I drink. Uh, I drink four of these a day. Okay, that's your green. That's your green sludge. No, I I had my thing for the day already. Thirty pounds. You're down thirty. Yeah. To what? Well, that's the embarrassing part. I mean, I'm still fat. I'm 218. But 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 with a but with an anchor? Yeah. Like yeah. popping pound a day. Yeah. I started having a little solid food yesterday. I had some soup. I don't think that counts as solid food. Well, it was warm. I've had my first warm food in a month. Seriously? You but did nothing great. but nothing but those those shakes or whatever? Yeah, the occasional apple and some carrots. Yeah, man. All right. So your bladder is going to bring the show to an end? Is that what you're saying? Basically. And it's not that I don't love you. It's that I love not having wet pants. I love dry pants a lot more than having wet pants. I understand. Yeah. Uh, I really miss you, Jeff. You live a you live really far away, and what do you call that? The uh, Atlantic Northeast. I call it the Hudson Valley. Hudson Valley, okay, but yeah. okay, but the region, the region's Hudson Valley, also. Yeah, I, live I was thinking because you're Pacific Northwest, in England. I, although I can fucking throw a rock and hit Massachusetts practically. Right. Well, I was thinking we're the Pacific Northwest. Right. Wouldn't that make you the Atlantic Northeast? 
They but they don't say that. Maybe you could start it as a thing. Uh, they don't really like outsiders here. You just kind of try to blend in. I mean, they call me a idiot around here because I came from Brooklyn. Wow. I know me, yeah. right? But funny. <laughs> but but don't they know you're from Granite Falls? No. You got your card carrying, man. Yeah. Show them your belly. Show them your care. belly. I know, I know, I know. They don't care. That you yeah. know, the fire hall, they fight idiots, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I miss you too, and I wish you didn't live so far away. Well, I, I'm hoping that I'll be in Seattle this year at some point. Well, I'll be here. I look forward to I I just want a hug. Just want a nice strong man yeah. hug. Okay. We're, we're face to face this time though, okay, pal? Uh you know, don't shame me. <laughs> I'm just saying I'm you always ask for those slow, firm hugs from behind, and they make me uncomfortable for you. You know, listen. I'm just saying. It's really not your place to shame me for anything. It's not shaming. It's just, you know, I think you should. Any of my playful practices. I'm just saying. Just saying. Don't, you know, face to face. I'm a person too, you know. Look, I'm not just a strong arms. Yeah. And a trunk. Yeah. <laughs> um, love you, buddy. Love you too, man. Thanks for making time to talk to me. You're very welcome. And 110% the best with the show. It's it's great. I'll plug it at the top. Uh, anything of note that you want me to plug up at the top? Um, when's it coming out? Uh, let's see. Not this monday the monday following whatever that date is that's the eighth yeah like that um whatever that is um yeah just uh that well we can talk about it um we are uh this whole this friday next friday and the following friday um we're doing the blaine cook greg gilmore duff mckagan uh trifecta leading into the thing release that loose groups doing oh rad yeah so those are the next three and we're gonna we're gonna do a live stream tonight um to kind of do a lead into that um but yeah that's kind of that's our that's our uh that's our trajectory and then kurt block is going to come in and kind of do the the follow-up to tell us what those youngsters got wrong well yeah i mean he that's like it's like having Wikipedia come in. It's like having one of those, what's the wizard Gandalf come in? I mean, it's like he's the fucking guy. He like, he yeah. knows everything and you know, yeah. He Thanks. can take you back there. He doesn't have to just tell you. He can fucking put his cloak around you. And, ah! <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Uh, I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, man. Later. Bye.